Zion Teacher Series. Today's teacher is Dr. Brian J. Bailey. Dr. Bailey is an internationally known Bible teacher and prolific author of over 35 books, which have been translated into more than 15 languages. In his 50-year ministry, he has traveled to over 100 countries, ministering in churches, Bible schools, pastors' conferences, leadership seminars, television, and radio. Dr. Bailey is currently the president of Zion Fellowship International and senior pastor of Zion Chapel, both of which are located in Waverly, New York, on top of Glory Hill. He is also president of Zion Ministerial Institute and Zion University, which have over 30 affiliate Bible schools around the world. In today's edition of Zion Teacher Series, we will in today's edition of Zion Teacher Series, we will look at the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Dr. Bailey will give us a practical understanding of the gifts and fruits of the Spirit and how they are to operate in our church today. So join with us now as we open our hearts to what the Lord wants to speak to us about the blessed Holy Spirit, the Comforter. Welcome again to our series on the Holy Spirit. And this is lecture number nine when we're continuing our theme on the fruit of the Holy Spirit. As we've previously said, the Apostle Paul likens our hearts to the garden of the Lord. God loves gardens. We have a saying in England, you are nearest to God in a garden. Because a garden is filled with all kinds of beautiful plants that the Lord God has created. But we are interested, of course, in our own lives. We are interested in not having these natural plants in our houses, but rather having the fruit of the Spirit, those glorious nine plants, nine spiritual plants in our hearts. And so, we're going to look at how we can become fruitful, how our gardens can become a delight to the Lord, so that the Lord himself would be delighted to walk into our gardens and taste of the fruit of his Spirit in our lives. So, first of all, we're going to consider how the fruit of the Spirit can be developed in our lives. And the Lord himself, the Lord Jesus himself, in John's Gospel, chapter 15, gives us many clear-cut pointers as to how that can be, how we can have a beautiful garden of the Spirit in our lives. It's interesting that the Lord's concern just prior to his crucifixion, when speaking to his disciples, was that they and we should bring forth fruit, more fruit and much fruit. And so, he tells us the way in John's Gospel, chapter 15. And first of all, he speaks of thoroughly pruning or purging that is done by the Heavenly Father. You know, when we consider a vine, or when we consider any tree for that matter, any of you who have been in vineyards or orchards, and perhaps walked with the orchardist himself as he has examined his trees, you will notice that he pays particular attention to which branches are producing fruit and which are not. And I was amazed because I was once pastor in a fruit-bearing part of the United States. And in my congregation, I did have those who owned orchards. And on one occasion, I walked through the orchard of one of the members of my congregation. And there, with I thought awesome brutality and cruelty he was just breaking off branch after branch and I said why are you doing that he said because I want fruit and if I permit those branches to remain on those trees 
then they will take up the life and the sap and the nutrients that are flowing from the roots of those trees. But they themselves will not produce fruit and they will impair the other branches from bringing fruit to perfection because, because, he said, they won't get as much as they could because it's taken by the useless branches. Well, the Father comes to us, if I could say, the branches. And what does he do? He breaks off a lot of things in our life that are certainly not fruitful. He breaks off a lot of activities. And some of those activities we might think, oh Lord, they're fruitful. But they have to be broken off so that other things that bear eternal fruit might be developed. And then there's a sense that we must be uh, constantly cleansed And that is done through the word of God. You know, in Ephesians chapter 5, it speaks of the church being cleansed by the Lord, by the washing of the word. It is, as we read the word of God, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit and under the direction of the, the Lord, and read in those portions that he's directing us to, they reveal things in our life. And as we are obedient to what we read, they cleanse us. We are washed by the water of the word. And then another thing is this. In order to produce fruit, in order to produce fruit, there is a sense that the branch must do two things. Number one, it must abide. And here's our little branch and It must abide in the vine. Here's our tree. It must abide. If it's outside, it cannot produce fruit. So first of all, it must abide in the the, uh, tree. And we have to abide in Christ. How are we to abide in Christ? Well, the Lord said this. That if we will keep his commandments, if we keep the Ten Commandments, if we will be obedient to him, then we shall abide in him. The disobedient are taken out. It's only the obedient that are allowed to remain. So, number one, we have to be obedient to the commandments of God. Number one. And then, number two, you know, there's another factor. You know, we have to abide in Christ, but the life of Christ has to flow through that branch. And so, how do we abide in Christ? By obeying his word, obeying his commandments. But then, how does the life of Christ flow through us? It is as we read his word. As we read his word. Then his life flows through us. Then, moving on, we understand this, that we have fulfilled those four precepts, being pruned from things that activities that don't benefit us, from being thoroughly cleansed by obedience to the word of God, by abiding in Christ, by keeping his commandments, and then that the life of Christ flows in us as he abides in us, through his living word, meditating on his word. Now, let us look at these nine fruit of the Spirit. And there is another thought concerning the development of the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. There is a principle in the word of God that we are developed by the bitter and the sweet. The bitter and the sweet. We could look at Queen Esther, who was being prepared for the throne to marry Artaxerxes, the king. And the interesting thing is this, that all the women who were being prepared to be presented before the king, 
had six months of bitter herbs and six months of sweet oils. We have to have the bitter and the sweet in order to develop the fruit of the Spirit. We might understand that from a tree. You know, those in times past who wanted to build wooden ships would indeed realize that the most important part of the ship was the foremast. And that foremast had to be a tree that was very resilient. And so what they did was to send their people into a forest and then they would pick out a tree that they thought could indeed qualify as a foremast of the ship because that foremast had to take all the uh, storms or the brunt of the winds. And if that cracked, everything cracked. And so great care was taken on the choosing of that foremast. Well, what they did, they would choose trees that they thought would qualify. Then the amazing thing is that they would cut out all the trees around, such that that tree stood alone. And so that tree could receive all the benefit of the rays of the sun, the sweet. But also, it would be subject to all the storms. Nothing would protect it, the bitter. And so it is with the development of the fruit of the Spirit. We have to have the presence of God. We have to have the times that we pass in his presence. We have to have the times of blessing. But we must also have the times of great stress, trials and bitternesses and sorrows in our heart. And so, as we continue with this study on the nine fruit of the Spirit, I'd like to point out this, that the fruit is developed by the sweet, but also by the opposite, by the opposite. Love is developed by the love of God, us receiving of the love of God, but also hatred, hatred. You see, let's go back to this foremast of the ship. What does the storm do to that tree that is exposed? Well, in actuality what it does, it sends the roots down and it makes the trunk more resilient. And that is true with love. You see, love is, if I could say this, very tough. As we shall see later on, there are three aspects of love. We have to love God, we have to love our neighbor, we also have to love our enemy. Those three aspects of love. And so, therefore, love is developed you know, amongst the winds, the cold or hot winds, shall I say, of hatred's fires. Joy is developed by passing through the valley of Baca, the valley of sorrow. All this we will develop a little bit later, but I just want to emphasize this for the moment. Peace comes to maturity in places of great confusion. Long suffering, of course, can only come to maturity through long and arduous trials. Those are the hands of people. Gentleness. Well, that can only truly come to maturity. Surrounded by the ungrateful, the harsh, and the unthankful. 
goodness can only manifest itself maturely in the presence of those who are cruel and deceitful. Faithfulness, well, can only be come to perfection by the failure and betrayal of those we've trusted the most. As with Judas in the life of Jesus. And then meekness can only come to maturity in the presence of anger which seeks to provoke it and rebellion. Self-control, temperance, can only come to maturity as it's exercised graciously amongst those of unrestrained lusts and passions and desires. So, the fruit is developed with those four things that we spoke of, pruning, obedience, abiding in Christ and Christ in us, but also through contrasts. Now we're going to have a look at the ninth fruit. Love. How can we define love? Well, of course, the poets can do it so beautifully, but often so vainly. Because love, in effect, is a commitment. We are commanded as husbands to love our wives as Christ loved his church. Now there can be no higher commandment. Our love is going to be measured against the love that Christ has for his church. Our love for our wife is going to be measured against his love for his church. It is tremendous. So what is love? Well, love is a commitment. Love is a commitment to someone else. Love, you know, covers so many things, isn't it? We could say it's warmth. You know, love is not just giving gifts because in this realm of marriage, I have seen those who are wealthy give extraordinary, expensive gifts to their wives who are not impressed. A necklace of costly rubies or diamonds does not cover infidelity. Now I've seen the wealthy receive bouquets and all kinds of dresses and clothes and accoutrements of this world from their husbands. And yet, looking in their eyes, all I can see is bitterness. Why? Because they have not got what they really need, love. Well, what is love? It's a commitment to be faithful. And in actuality, love, I suppose, is a summation of God's own character. For God is love, and all you think of Concerning God, the attributes you pay to him really are summed up in love. And so, love, yes, it's a warm feeling, it's affection, it's kindness, but it is a lifelong commitment to another to care for them, for their every need, with loving kindness. You see, it is not only what we do, but the source from which our actions come. And so, we must 
meditate much on that. But as I say, you see, love is indeed a fruit of the Spirit. And here, I want to pause a moment and consider aspects of love. Because unlike the English language, the Greek has four words for love. And I want to consider them. The first word we would consider is eros, which is basically the love, the physical love, between husband and wife. And that is very precious. It is to be treasured, but it is to be confined to our marriage partner. The next Greek word for love is storge, and it refers to family love, the love that parents have for children. And this, of course, is very important because that gives stability to the family and it gives stability to the church because the family, after all, is the foundation of the church. And then we have another Greek word which is philo, which basically could be interpreted as the love of friends. And certainly, we want to have friends because friends strengthen us, friends help us, and friends, if I I could say this, are faithful to us and they correct us if we're wrong and also they encourage us if we're right. We need friends. And there is that special Greek word, philo, which means the love between friends. But there is this fourth Greek word for love, which is agape. And the only way I could translate agape or interpret agape is unconquerable benevolence. And it is, if I could say this, like a river of loving kindness that flows out from the heart. And that word agape means God's love. It is divine. It is the fruit of the Spirit. And that unconquerable benevolence, that flow of loving kindness, is in actuality to be manifested towards God himself for we are commanded to love God with all our hearts with all our strength with all our mind we are to have a mind centered upon God we are to use all the strength that we have to love him then also that love is to flow out to our neighbours and one when God or the Lord himself was speaking on this, he said, well, who is my neighbor? And the Lord gave that memorable parable concerning the Good Samaritan. Remember the story of how he went down from Jerusalem, down on the road to Jericho, and there was one who had been abused by robbers and so forth, the priest, the Levite, pass on the other side, but this good Samaritan, who wasn't really of the family of God, he saw the needs, bound up the wounds, poured in the oil and the wine, and said to the uh, innkeeper, well, you know, if it costs you any more, I'll pay when I come back. The Lord said, well, that was his neighbor, you see. A neighbor doesn't mean somebody scripturally, that you know or lives in close proximity to you. It is somebody else in need. And that loving kindness must flow out to them. But then, the third manifestation of this loving kindness must flow to our enemies. And I think there's no greater example of this 
than in the uh, life of the Lord Jesus Christ. The love that he showed to Judas. And we must remember that Jesus always knew who Judas was. In fact, he had chosen him to fulfill the prophecy of Psalm 109. And so, in a very real sense, throughout his ministry of three and a half years, the Lord treated Judas just like one of the other disciples. He gave him the same privileges, he gave him the same power, he showed upon, showered upon him the same consideration. And even when the Last Supper came, and the Lord troubled in spirit, said to his disciples, one of you is going to betray me, None of them knew who it was. Peter said to uh, John, ask him, and John uh, said to the Lord, well, who is it? And he said, well, it's the one who might give a sop or a piece of bread and dip it in the wine and give it to him. And uh, all the other disciples still did not realize who Judas was. And then, even when the betrayal took place in the Garden of Gethsemane, we find that when Judas came with all the cohort of Roman soldiers, the soldiers of Herod and the priests and so forth, the Lord greeted him and said, Friend, are you going to betray the Son of God with a kiss? Such love, if I could say this, flowed out. It was a love that would have sought to have won Judas, but Judas would not. And yet, after he had betrayed him, it seemed that Judas was so convicted by the demeanor of the Lord that he took those thirty pieces of silver, threw them down at the chief priest's feet and said, I have betrayed a righteous man. They said, what is that to us? You know, But here we see the love of Jesus towards Judas, his great enemy. And I just want to say this, that even on the cross he said, forgive them for they know not what they do, to those who were crucified. And so I want to commend the love of God that is divine to you. All the other aspects of love will not meet the need. It has to be the fruit of the Spirit which grows in a well-watered garden watered by the Spirit of God for that fruit is divine and not human. May God grant that that fruit develops in our own lives and hearts. God bless you.